Smashamaniacs. Welcome to episode 175 of the Geo Gearheads. We're glad to have everyone back. I'm Daryl W. Four for my regular co-host, uh, Chris Umfenauer, better known as the Bad Cop, and we have a special guest today to talk about uh, puzzle caching. Well, that special guest is Cully Long, better known as Child of Adam, author, get this, he is the author of How to Puzzle Cache. He wrote the book. Welcome. I did I did. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Now, you know I had to throw that out there just because. So, um, we're talking with you today about your book, How to Puzzle Cash. Mm -hmm. um, now, last week, we uh, sent our viewers or listeners uh, to a website. There were several preview pages of your book available. Indeed. And one of those preview pages was 282. Can you mm -hmm. tell us... and? I, I'm assuming you can do this from the top of your head because, well, you are the author of the book. And I what do is, have every word memorized. Yes, exactly. And the location on the page. Can you tell us what the first word on in the title on that page is? Uh, cipher, I believe. It is Cipher. That was the correct answer. And the uh, person who sent in the correct entry for that was uh, Going to Carolina. Yeah, one of the many to uh, enter, and he was drawn as our lucky winner. Uh, and as his prize, he picked a couple of those uh, state flag tags. But he also wrote that uh, Cully's book is terrific, by the way. Uh, really has given me a new perspective on puzzle caches. Oh, well, thank you, going to Carolina. That's very nice. And it is a really wonderful book, a handy resource. I know a lot of people uh, like to take advantage of. And that's why we had you on, because it's a great way to kind of figure out how to get into uh, puzzle caching, great resource if you even know about puzzle caching, especially for things like the ciphers. I love those uh, flow charts. Oh, but, thanks. Yeah, I worked on those for quite a while. Yeah, I'm sure. But really what we want to do today is kind of get a feel for your process uh, that you can share with us about how to start with a uh, suspected puzzle cache. Yeah, I think that's the thing that scares most people. You know, they a lot of people are just flat out scared of puzzle caches and see them on their cache map and just have no idea what to do with them. Um, I think the biggest thing that you can keep in mind is that you have an enormous advantage with puzzle caches that most puzzle solvers in any other sort of like puzzle pursuit don't have is that you kind of already know what the answer is going to be. You know, like 98% of the time, that cache is going to resolve to coordinates, which is not something that you can say about any other group of puzzles. You know, there are all of these people like the MIT Puzzle Pursuit and um, those kinds of places where they have these puzzle competitions. They have no idea what they're looking for when they go in, but at least we know that we're looking for coordinates at the end, and that gives us a big advantage. The other thing you can kind of be guaranteed of is that at some point over the course of this puzzle, you're going to have to use a GPS because that's kind of one of the unwritten guidelines at uh, GroundSpeak is that there has to be a GPS component occurring somewhere over the course of this. So if you haven't gotten to a point of using a GPS yet, you're probably not finished with the cache yet. You know, probably not finished with the puzzle yet. Nice. So you figured out that you're going to get coordinates and, of course, those coordinates are entered into a GPS. So once you figured out it's a puzzle, what's your next step? I mean, how do you well, determine what type? Uh, well, one thing that you want to make sure, you know, before you get too scared off is to make sure that it actually is a puzzle. You know, the, the mystery category at geocaching.com covers a lot of different things. You know, it could be a challenge. It could be a field puzzle, which are often very easy. It could be just a simple offset, which is also fairly easy. You know, all of that sort of stuff comes underneath the puzzle caching banner, which I think a lot of people may not realize that it all sort of gets lumped together there and might be ignoring some things that are actually pretty easy if they took the time to look at it. 
But once you've determined that it actually is a puzzle and that's what you're looking for, um, the first place that I always start is with the things that the CO can control. Uh, COs are granted control over a certain number of things on the cache page that are up to them to change. You know, everything else is uniform from cache page to cache page. But the CO kind of has a few things that he can do. Uh, first thing is their own name. I don't think a lot of people realize that it, when you create a cache, you don't have to put your own name underneath there. You know, it'll still come up under your profile if they search for you, but you can put whatever name you want in there. It could be something thematic to the puzzle. Uh, you know, I, there's a couple cachers here in New Jersey that have a different name on every single puzzle that he's put out um, that are usually thematic to something that's happening in the puzzle. So look at the name, see if there's anything interesting there. It might be a clue. Uh, second thing that they can control is the placed by date, which is something else that I don't think people pay a lot of attention to, is uh, when you start creating a cache page, you can put in any date you want as long as it's in the past. Uh, you can't create a future date. But And there are ways to make that thematic to the cache or to be a hint. You know, if you put in the date of D-Day, for instance, or the date that the Titanic sank, you know, that could be something thematically linked to what you're doing. And I think the big one, of course, is the cache name. You know, often COs will give you a big hint in the name of what it is. Um, and it really helps if you, this is one of those, like, Catch-22 moments where it helps if you've had some puzzle experience because then you can see something in the cache name that might be a hint. But if you haven't had a lot of puzzle experience, you might overlook that. Um, but one of my big things, one of my biggest pieces of advice to people is to just sort of get on the Internet and look around, you know, there's places like uh, rumkin.com that specializes in ciphers and a website called Omniglot, which is all about different alphabets. And I've solved many, many caches just because I recognized, oh, that is an alphabet that I saw on Omniglot that time. Let me go and look at Omniglot and see if I can find that alphabet again. And that really just comes from spending a couple hours sitting there looking through that website and looking at all the different alphabets and getting familiar with it. So, you know, then once you get to the cache name, you know, if you see, like, a reference to the future and then there's something encoded, you might be able to put together, oh, that's just the alphabet from Futurama. Or if they say something about the cache being super and then a code, you might be able to put together, oh, that's just Kryptonian, you know, the alphabet that they use in the Superman comics. So, you know, if you f the more familiar you are with this sort of stuff, the easier ca puzzle caches become, really. Yeah, and what better way to uh, spend those nasty uh, days that you can't go caching than you know, trying to solve the puzzles? Absolutely. We did get a, uh, a question in the live Q&A from uh, Team Pugach going kind of back to what we were talking about earlier, and he asked, what is the difference between a puzzle cache and a field puzzle attribute? Uh, field puzzles mean that you have to actually go out into the field and do something. Um, usually it's get some piece of information off a sign or a plaque or, you know, a lot of times it's things like um, there'll be a historical plaque and they'll say, uh, find the year that this building was built and you want the second digit of that year becomes the fourth digit in your coordinates. Or, you know, the number of people who died in an Indian raid at this place is the coordinates for the north, something like that. So you have to actually go out into the field and figure that part out to use that. So, um, you know, that's, I call those research puzzles because it's not something that you can really, sometimes you can figure it out at home, but usually you have to go out into the field and find what they're pointing you at. All right. Well, let's get back to the uh, cache description uh, stuff that you were talking about, where that's uh, um, the first thing that you probably want to look at, correct? Yeah. So, you know, after you've looked at those three things, the CO's name, the place by date, and the name of the cache, um, then you can start looking at the things on the cache page that are still controlled by the CO but aren't directly on the cache page. Uh, one thing that a lot of people overlook is directly underneath the coordinates for the cache, there'll sometimes be a little button that says related website. Um, 
it won't be there if the CEO hasn't provided something like that. But if the CEO does provide that, there'll be that little link there. And that's the CEO's way of telling you that, oh, there's some information over here that you might want. Sometimes the whole puzzle is over there at this other website. Sometimes it's just uh, you know a link to something that's thematically connected or something that will help you understand something in the puzzle, maybe a cipher solver, something like that. But those are always important. Um, the background image for the page, CO has control of that. And uh, once you, you can click into that, sometimes the puzzles are hidden there, sometimes there's a hint there, that sort of thing. Um, the dummy coordinates, which are the coordinates at the top of the page, you know, they, the caches always say uh, cache is not at these coordinates, et cetera, et cetera. But sometimes the dummy coordinates will have a hint. You know, for instance, if maybe the puzzle has something to do with pie and you look at the street view for the dummy coordinates and you see uh, pie shop, or if you look at the, those coordinates on a map and see that it's on, you know, arithmetic street, you might know that, oh, there's going to be some math coming up in this or something like that. Um, you could also use the additional waypoints to do that same sort of thing. You know, the um, COs can provide, I don't know, is there a limit on how many additional waypoints you can provide. I've seen caches with 40 and 50, so I don't know if there's an upper limit to that. Yeah, that I know of there is not, but I don't know for sure yeah. that there is not. But if there's a list of additional waypoints, you know, again, it might be things that are hints, or it might be actual pieces of the puzzle. Um, you know, I've seen ones that point to where you have a list of... Um, additional waypoints that point to buildings that are shaped like numbers, and you have to put that together, or uh, point to um, streets, and you just form a sentence from the street names, that sort of thing. So additional waypoints are always an interesting place to look. And then you can also use additional waypoints in something that I call orienteering in the book, um, which is kind of a, um, an old Boy Scout game where you're given, it's sort of like um, geocaching except with compass and paper. You know, you're given a map and you're given a compass and you're told uh, go this many feet on a bearing to this point, et cetera, and uh, the scouts would have to perform those little maneuvers. But there's a lot of stuff that sort of crosses back into geocaching where you can have to figure out overlaps of circles, you know, like places where the circles overlap. Maybe that's where the puzzle is. Or, or where the actual cache is, or intersecting lines. Um, another is something that's called a centroid, where if you have a whole series of caches that are sort of in a vague shape, you can calculate this. what's called the centroid, which is the central point of that shape, which involves a little bit of geometry and a little bit of math, but there are websites that'll do it for you and sort of start to get that put together for you. Um, Another place that you can look is in the gallery. Uh, COs can put up um, images that might contain the puzzle or images that might be hints towards the puzzle. Uh, you can also hide, I've seen a lot of puzzles recently where the puzzles were actually hidden in the description for a trackable that was in the inventory for the website, or inventory for the cache. Um, so if you look at the list of trackables, then like scroll all the way down to the bottom of the logs, see when the reviewer posted that cache, like what was that date, and compare that to how long some of those trackables have been in there. If there's a trackable that's been there since before the cache was actually published, I would look really hard at that, because there's going to be some reason that that trackable has been sitting there for that long. Um, you can also look at the bookmark lists, um, that's another one that's been popular lately for some reason. I've seen a lot of puzzles that basically come down to what uh, what the bookmark list is. And it might be a list of caches that the CO has found and there's something hidden in his logs for each of those caches. Or it might be, um, I saw one a couple of weeks ago that the last letter of the GC code in the uh, bookmark list spelled out the coordinates. Wow. Uh, and then the final thing is if they've provided you with a geo checker on the page, 
even if you don't have the answer yet, go ahead and click over to the GeoChecker and just look at it. Because sometimes there are certain GeoCheckers that will allow you to input a keyword instead of coordinates. So if and you want to know right away if that's what you're looking for, and it'll tell you that when you get there. So go ahead and click over just to check what format is this answer going to be in. Like I said, 98% of the time it's going to be coords, but that 2%, if there's a GeoCheck, maybe that's a way of figuring that out. So that's like the things that are on the page, the things that are right there that you can start looking at. And I know it seems overwhelming. <laughs> well, no, actually, that's a really good place to start. I mean... You're exactly right. Those are the things that the CEO can control and change in the website so, or, or in the web page. So, what what next? Uh, well, the next thing for me is always research. I will. I am an obsessive Googler. I will Google anything. You know, I will go every word that's in that description. If it's an odd turn of phrase, if it's a word that I've never heard before, if it's a word I'm not certain of the definition of, go ahead and Google it. I want to know everything that is possible to know about all of those words. Um, the same thing is um, you can do that with images now. Um, Google has a reverse image search where you can take the image from the cache page, search for that through Google, and it will show you everywhere on the web that that image also appears. And sometimes that's a really good key. You know, if you're looking for, like, the make of a car or something, if you're not really a car person, you know, I'm not really a car person, but if I put an image of a car into reverse search at Google and I see that, oh, that's a 1974 model, whatever, then maybe that's part of what I'm looking for, you know, is that year or that make and model, whatever. Um, Google does that for you. There's also a website called tin-i.com. That's a tin, like the metal, T-I-N, that will reverse image search for you. And I've heard that a couple of the other, like, I think Bing is doing reverse image searches now. I haven't actually tried theirs yet, but uh, I know Google and tin-i will do it for you. And yeah, as well as uh, Google yeah. Goggles. Mm -hmm. I have not tried that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, just finding out that sort of information. And sometimes it's uh, it's as simple as just taking a couple of words off the page and Googling it, and you'd be surprised at what turns up, you know, what kind of information is available out there, that sort of thing, to help you figure out what exactly it is that you're looking for. But research is big, big step for me. Nice. Well... All this great information has really churned up a lot of uh, conversation in the chat room. So oh, good. live, live Q&A, let's go over to that for just a second. Jennifer comments in the live Q&A, you know, field, the field puzzle attribute is often used for mechanical puzzles as well. So we talked uh, briefly about field puzzles. Okay, live I had not thought about that. Yeah, there you go. I, I had one of those caches out where I, you know, put the, the field puzzle attribute, because the coordinates led you right to the cache. You had to figure out how to get it open. Right. Uh, Limax asks, or, or states, that orienteering is an older Boy Scout merit badge. I believe it's been rolled into the geocaching merit badge. Oh, so, interesting. There you go. I, 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 I sometimes see orienteering courses at uh, state parks. You know, mm -hmm. you'll go into state parks and find... Uh, orienteering course signs out on the trails and that sort of thing. So I know it's still done around, but... It is, and it's very competitive. I just came across one a couple of weeks ago and was able to talk with the with uh, one of the participants, and it was, it was uh, fascinating to me what they do. <laughs> so, but we're not here to talk about orienteering tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Limax also asks a question. He says, I've done a bit of reading of my book, which my lovely wife gave me for my birthday. What is your recommendation for reading the book? Is it made to be read cover to cover, or should it be based on the kind of puzzle? Um, it's written sort of progressively. You know, I, I do start with ideas that sort of build on to each other. For instance, uh, before I get to codes or ciphers, I introduce the idea of um, what I call substitutions, where 
you know, basically it's a code, but uh, I'm not calling it that yet. You know, it's it's the idea of like um, if there are a list of 14 things on the page, how can those 14 things turn into numbers? You know, ha is there a way of substituting a number for that thing? You know, if it's a list of um, elements, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, atomic elements, is there a way that I can substitute a number for each one of those atomic elements, that sort of thing. So I, I introduce the idea of that and then sort of build on that to introduce the idea of codes, which comes in the next chapter, and then that builds up and turns into ciphers, et cetera, et cetera. So it is sort of a progressive uh, book in that way, that it, it um, starts you off small, starts you off with the simple stuff, and then and introduces you to the ideas that you need, and then builds up and starts showing you how you can implement those in different ways. Uh, you know, some of the latter chapters, once you start getting into math and music and that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, if you're not familiar with some of the stuff that's going on in the beginning, then it might be a little difficult to put some of that together. But at the same time, I also designed it to be a, um, a reference book. So, you know, once you've read through it, I have an index in the back so that you can come back to specific pages and find, you know, the Braille chart or um, where I talk about Maya numerals or that sort of thing. So I would read it first straight through and then later come back to it as a reference guide to start jumping back into things. It's designed to be used both ways. Very good. So the answer is really both. Yes. Hopefully. And the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. And then getting back to the uh, live Q&A, uh, Dane Morgan asked, is there an order to uh, you go through from most to least common puzzle types? Um, within the book or in the world? Or? I believe he's talking with in general as far as trying to solve the puzzles. That, that would be my take on it. Yeah, you know, that's really going to vary depending on where you are in the world. Uh, for instance, uh, I was in San Francisco a couple of months ago. San Francisco has a, a million puzzles, and they all seem to be computer-related. And every one of them was over my head. You know, it was all like programming stuff and debugging languages and all this kind of stuff that I had no idea how to even start looking at. Uh, whereas New York City stuff tends to be a lot of codes. You know, we, for whatever reason, there's a bunch of people around here that really like ciphers and codes, so that shows up. So it's really going to depend on what's popular in your area, you know, who's living there. Because um, that's going to, you know, San Francisco has a lot of computer people and a lot of coders that are going to start doing computer-based puzzles, whereas I'm not really sure why New York likes their ciphers so much, but they do. Um, so it's really going to depend on where you're at as to what's going to be most popular around you. Just... You know, have a look around and see what's there. But, like I said, the more you do, the better you get at it. You know, it's like anything. Even if you're not able to solve the actual puzzle that you're looking at right there, your research might lead you to something that will help you solve another one that you looked at a couple of weeks ago. Or one that you're going to look at in the future that you don't even know about yet. You know, there's been plenty of times where I've stumbled across answers to puzzle caches that have been stumping me for weeks when I was looking for something else entirely. So Limex my does advice is the, just uh, get out there. Limex does say in the uh, live Q&A that uh, they are very proud of their uh, puzzle caches in uh, San Francisco. Yes. Yes, but, you know, they may be very specific in their range. So if you're uh, Limex, I, I think it's up to you now to do some ciphers and codes just to throw everybody off there in San Francisco. <laughs> just a toy with those programmers. So, uh, Dane, I mean, we've had some great questions in the Q&A, but let's get back to uh, looking at a cache page, uh, a puzzle cache page, and deciphering, or I'm, that's not the right term there, and trying to determine what kind of uh, puzzle it can be. Uh, well, the next thing for me is to start looking at uh, the cache page really close up, you know, like the in-depth sort of look. Um, one of the first things that I do anytime I show up at any cache page is to do 
a control A, or I think it's command A on a PC, that will select everything on the page. Because um, you can, as a CO, you can hide things in white text. So there's actually text there on the page that you as the user can't see at first because it's white on white. But once you select everything on the page and it's all highlighted, now you can see what's hidden in between the other lines of text, what else is there. Um, a lot of COs use that as a way of hiding an extra clue or uh, you know, sometimes the whole that's the whole puzzle is just that that's where it is. So that's usually like step one is just command A, let me see what's there, what's hidden in that stuff. Um, the next thing for me is usually then to go into the source code. Um, I know that seems scary for a lot of people because it's a lot of overwhelming HTML that if you're just not familiar with it, um, you can get really lost in it and it's kind of hard to meander your way through. But there's really only one section that you're looking for. Um, once you get the that window open for the source code, over on the left-hand side there will be a series of numbers. If you just scroll down until you get to about the 600s, and start looking for the phrase user supplied content or you can do a search on the page to find user supplied content. There's a very short section there that is what the CO typed into the description and there's ways of hiding text in there that won't actually show up on the cache page. It'll only be visible when you look at it in the source code and again a lot of COs use this as a way to put in an extra hint or to hide something on the page um, but there's a couple other things that you can also look for in the source code. You can look for places where they've changed the font. Um, there's a couple of ciphers that are based purely on what the font looks like. Um, the bacon cipher in particular is often set up where uh, the cipher itself is built into whether it's a regular letter or an italic letter. And in the source code, if you can see that they've put in random italic letters in the middle of words, then you definitely know that you're looking for something that has to do with that. You know, why are those random letters italicized? Could be a Bacon cipher, could just be that if you pull all of those letters out, they spell the coordinates. You know, that's, it could be as simple as that. Um, you can also check and see if they've changed the colors of any letters. Same deal. Um, and you can also look at the colors of the colors themselves could be the puzzle. You know, there's a certain little like six letter code there, the hexadecimal code for the number, for the color rather. And uh, that hexadecimal code could be your coordinates. You know, that could be what you're looking for is that little six digit number there. Um, and it's just that they changed the font color and hit it in that way. Um, Another really interesting one that has shown up a lot is looking for breaks in the text. You know, if you if you do a paragraph return in the text, a little um, it's a carrot with a B and another carrot. If if you start looking for those, or a carrot with a P, because um, geocaching.com accepts either of those. Uh, if you see a lot of those, that means that the CO has gone through there and like broken that text up for some reason. And you have to start wondering, well, why do they want it to break up in that particular way? You know, why do they need a return in the middle of this sentence here? And a lot of times it can be because you're, uh, it forms what's called an acrostic on the side of the page where you just read downwards in the paragraph instead of across and the letters that connect downwards spell something out for you. Um, so looking in the... Um, Source code can tell you all sorts of things, even if you if it's things that the CO may not have intended you to actually pay that much attention to. Looking in the source code is always a good step. I seem to remember a uh, puzzle once that had A's, B's, C's bolded, and then you had to like draw the lines between all of the A's to get the first one on, all the B's to get the second one. So yeah, there's, nice. there's some weird ones out there that uh, uh, might be a little easier than they seem. Yeah. Well, you know, again, it it really has to do with with your own experience. I think that's one of the things that uh, people, 
you know, even if it's a five-star difficulty puzzle, it might be the simplest thing in the world for you. You know, like going back to my San Francisco example, if you are a computer programmer and you show up in San Francisco and start looking at those puzzles, they might seem like child's play to you. Whereas to me, who has not used any sort of computer programming since basic, it looked like, you know, the worst gibberish I've ever come across. So what's a five-star puzzle to you may not be a five-star puzzle to me and vice versa, just depending on what kind of knowledge you have. You know, I do a lot of puzzles that have to do with um, graphics and graphic design because that's what I do in my everyday life. So that sort of stuff creeps into my puzzles sometimes. And other people that have come through and done my puzzles, if they know about that, then it's a very easy puzzle to them. That's one of the things that makes putting the difficulty on the page actually really difficult for a CEO because it's really hard for me to know, well, what's common knowledge? You know, what, what will other people out in the world know about this particular topic as opposed to me who, you know, just spent a couple of days researching it or, you know, I've known about it all my life or whatever. It may not be common knowledge to everybody. Yeah, and even if you have a, a buddy go and uh, uh, beta test it, it could be that it's uh, common knowledge to them because you have shared interests usually, and that's why you're friends. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But not. I was going to ask, uh, how how do you tell what type of puzzle it is? You know, sometimes it's going to be easy, but you know, sometimes it's definitely more challenging. Um. It, yes. Um. And there's a lot of puzzles that just defy categorization. You know, there's a lot of puzzles in, especially in the geocaching world, that are really kind of one-offs. That you're only ever going to see that style of puzzle on that one cache page, and it's never going to show up anywhere else in the world. On the other hand, there's a ton of puzzles out there that are just based on standard everyday things that we come across. You know, there's plenty of crossword puzzles and Sudoku and nonograms and that sort of thing that are just standard puzzles that you will see every day in your regular newspaper. So um, a lot of COs will just pick those up and use those as their regular cache puzzle as well. So, you know, have a look at the cache page. If it looks like a crossword puzzle, chances are it probably actually is just a crossword puzzle. You know, you can go in there and do it. The CO hopefully has given you some way to pull coordinates out of that at the end. You know, I've, I've come across a couple where it's been kind of a mystery to me what to do with it after I solve the Sudoku or whatever, but hopefully the CO gives you a mechanism to pull those coordinates back out. Um, and then there's a lot of things that are just like basic variations on um, maybe some more obscure puzzles, but some things that uh, do still exist. Uh, you know, I have a puzzle myself that's based off of uh, a board game that I played on vacation a couple of years ago called Chocolate Fix. That It's just a logic puzzle where you're given um, a series of chocolates and a, a little uh, card, and the idea is to arrange the chocolates on the card to satisfy a specific set of rules. And I just borrowed that concept and turned it into a Western theme, and it's now uh, a puzzle I have called uh, Pioneer's Gate. It's exactly Chocolate Fix. So if you're familiar with Chocolate Fix, you can solve Pioneer's Gate. And I know that that's a puzzle, uh, you know, a, a game that you can go to Toys R Us and buy right now. There's also an app that is based on the same game. Um, but then the research step that I talked about earlier can also help you with a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, you know, if it's a, a ninja Sudoku and you've never seen a ninja Sudoku before where it's the five Sudoku grids that are arranged in a star pattern, if you run that through a um, reverse image search, chances are you're going to find a web page that will explain to you how to do that. You know, they may not find the exact puzzle that you have in front of you, but they'll find an example that looks pretty similar to it. And so you can start to find that sort of thing. Um, and like I said, hopefully, if it is something like that, hopefully the CO provides some way of you getting the cords out, whether it's like little numbered boxes or an ABC you put into the Sudoku or shaded out areas, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, recognizing puzzles is probably 50% of 
getting them solved. It's just looking at it and being able to figure out, well, what exactly kind of puzzle is this? But again, that goes back to that, that great thing that we have that other puzzle solvers don't, is that we already know what the answer looks like. Yeah. So that helps a lot, usually. Well, Dane Morgan echoes something that I do all the time. He says in the live Q&A, he says, I do that all the time here. I can't solve these things because I'm trying to solve something much harder than what they've actually done. You know, I look at it and think, well, okay, this has got to be an insanely complicated puzzle, so, you know, let's try working at the highest level rather than starting at the easiest level. Yes. I... I... As a puzzle CO, and now getting people who are emailing me about the puzzles that are contained in the book as well, um, that's often my one of my biggest pieces of advice is you're making this way too complicated. Just step back. You know, the, the very first puzzle in the book, because um, each chapter of the book has a puzzle at the end that is... Uh, like what I've discussed in the chapter. So it's basically there for you to practice on, you know, I've taught you this, now here's a puzzle of that style, go solve the puzzle yourself, figure that out. Um, the very first one, a lot of people trip up on that very first one, and it's almost always that they're just trying to make it too complicated. In the end, it's just a very, very simple piece of math, where I'm, just, I'm asking you to add 50.5 on the page, it says 50.5 plus x and there's a way in the puzzle for you to have figured out what X is. And for some reason, people keep coming back to me with like just sort of tacking X onto the end or adding it to the point five or whatever, and it's like, it, it's a whole number. Add them as whole numbers. You know, why are you trying to do something that's not called for? It's just math. It's just simple addition. But for whatever reason, I in the most recent update of the book, um, I, I go through... I've gone through a couple of times now and created, fixed some typos and things. I went back to that puzzle and kind of tweaked that one a little bit to hopefully get past that problem now. So we'll see if that helps. But, yeah, it's just people making it too complicated. Nice. Now, Limax also says in the live Q&A, the rule of thumb out here is that a puzzle will be four or higher if it requires special knowledge, such as music or electronics or what have you. So... That's good to know. Yeah, and again, that's really going to depend on your area. You know, if you have a geocaching community that have sort of made a silent agreement together that that's the way things are going to work, then that's awesome, and I'm I'm will happily put that into my knowledge bank if I ever get to cache in your area. But unfortunately, that sort of agreement doesn't exist everywhere in the world. Um, you know. I've had this conversation with many puzzle CEOs of like, well, how do you, how do you set your difficulties? How do you figure out what that is? And I had one guy who told me that it was about, for him, it was about steps. How many steps do you need to take? And uh, he said, if it's just a matter of taking my cipher and putting it into a solver and poof, you have the answer, that's one step, that's a one star, one star puzzle. Hmm. But if there's, you know, a file that you have to download and translate it into French and then run it through a solver and X, Y, and Z, then that's five steps, that's a five-star puzzle. So different people approach this in completely different ways. I like that idea. That makes sense to me. <laughs> because, you there know, you I, go. I, yeah, I often look at it, and I completely agree with you when you say that, um, you know, I've... I've made this puzzle, I've invested, you know, 10, 12 hours into it, it's glaringly obvious to me. Do I put it yes. as a three? Do I put it as a one? You know, it, so, but I like that. How many steps does it take? So that, uh, that kind of brings it a, a concrete solution to it. Yeah, that's definitely one way of looking at it. Well, you've said many times, uh, the thing that we're looking for are coordinates. Yes. And you've mentioned several times that uh, you look for a list of a certain number of objects, pictures, what have you. Can you go into yes. a little more detail on that? Uh, this is what I call in the book the geocaching magic numbers. 
And these numbers are going to be a little bit different depending on where you live in the world, uh, you know, because coordinates are different for everybody, uh, how many, according to how many digits they have, that sort of thing. But um, how many, the question is, how many digits do your local coordinates require in order to fully express those coordinates? You know, for New York City, it's typically 14. You know, I have seven digits in the north, seven digits in the west, if I'm using the standard format that's on geocaching.com. Um, it, a little further west, it's going to turn into 15 digits because you get into the, the 100s for the west. But um, so once you get out there, that turns into 15 digits. So it depends on where you are in the world. But if you look at, a, look at that cache page, and there's 14 things, you know, if you're me and you're living in New York City, and there's 14 things on there, whether it's 14 photographs or 14 lines of text or 14 things in a list or whatever, you can be pretty sure that each one of those things is going to somehow turn into one number in the coordinates. And it's just going to be in the order that they're presented on the page, or maybe you have to rearrange the order somehow, but... For the most part, each one of those things is going to turn into a coordinate. Now, some COs will get around this. You know, you can um, assume the decimals in a lot of places where COs will tell you, you know, you can assume the first digits of the north and the first digits of the west because they're probably not going to change. Um, so then maybe you're only looking for ten things because you're just looking for the five digits that are the minutes and the decimals for each of the north and west. Or maybe you're only looking for those decimals, in which case it would be six things. But 14, 15, 10, and 6 are like the big magic numbers. You know, if, if you look at a page and there's that many things, you're on the way. You know what you're looking for. And then you just have to start asking yourself, well, how do I turn that thing into a number? What is here that I can make a number out of? And start putting it into a coordinate. And it could be something as simple as how many words are in that sentence, how many letters are in that word, that sort of thing. Could be something that requires a little bit of knowledge. You know, if it's a list of baseball players, what are their uniform numbers? Or if they're NASCAR drivers, what are their car numbers? You know, that sort of thing. How can I take that and turn it into a number? And sometimes there's a lot of different ways to do it. You know, if you have a list of states, there's a lot of different ways that you can order that. It could be the year that it was founded, the order in which it was founded. You know, was it the first colony or the 15th colony or whatever? The order that they joined the Union. You know, was it the third state into the Union or the 48th state into the Union? How, what was that order? Could be uh, the order of the size that they are. It could be... Uh, how many counties they have could be, you know, what the major area code is. There's a whole bunch of ways that you could look at that. But um, basically, if you're coming across that list, start looking for ways that you can turn it into numbers. And there's a lot of different things out there in the world that have numbers that I don't think people know have numbers. Um, for instance, I just solved one. I, I solved a lot of puzzles for my mom. Uh, she's she's traveling around the U.S. in an RV, and so uh, she's constantly like sending me puzzles. It's like, have a look at this one. Let me see what uh, <laughs> help, help me find this that sort of thing. So, um, and then I solve a lot of puzzles at like Jennifer's blog and that sort of thing too. But um, I did one the other day that ended up being about Matchbox cars, and I found out that Matchbox cars have numbers. That since the first Matchbox cars, they've been progressively numbered. Apparently, the very first Matchbox car, if you look at the bottom of it, says MB001. And they're currently up to, like, MB952 or something like that. But it was just a matter of finding, matching those pictures of Matchbox cars to what they were, and then looking at a list on the toy company website and finding out, oh, that was MB004. That's the digit that I need. So... There's a lot of ways to get those numbers that, uh, even if you don't immediately think that there might be a number associated with it, start looking. You might find something. Interesting. Interesting. Well, one of the big things we've already talked about is all these uh, ciphers and codes, and we did a whole show on it, but what do you recommend people do 
if they suspect they have a, a cipher or code or something like that? Uh, well, I mean, going back to the beginning, um, if you've looked at enough websites, that sort of thing, hopefully you can start to familiarize yourself with what some of those codes are and those sort of names. Um, you know, COs will provide a lot of hints, but if you're not familiar with what they're hinting at, you know, it might not ever register with you that they're actually giving you a hint. You know, you can show up at a cache page and there can be, uh, my favorite example is the bacon cipher. If you show up at a cache page and there's pictures of pigs and uh, breakfast plates and lots of references to breakfast and diners and whatever in the page, the CO is going out of their way to talk to you about bacon, but if you don't know that there's a bacon cipher, then you're never going to pick up on exactly what it is that they're looking at. So go to Rumkin, uh, those sort of cipher places, and just look at the list. Look at the list of ciphers that those web pages will decode for you just so you can become familiar with what's out there in the world and the types of things that they can find. So hopefully, once you get to a cache page and you start seeing those hints, you can start picking up on exactly what it is that they're trying to help you with. Um, if that fails, if you get there and you don't immediately know what it is, if it's just letters, if there's nothing else on the, on the page except letters, my very first step on every cipher is to just copy and paste it and send it into a rotational cipher solver um, you know, we use ROT13, Rotation13, on every geocaching page. That's what the hint is encoded in. But there's 25 other variations on rotation ciphers. And there are websites that you can put it into that will show you all 25 of them at once. So if you just put that text in there, look at all 25 of them, sometimes it's just as easy as saying, oh, that was just ROT8, there's my text, I'm done. Um, if that doesn't work, you can start looking at uh, just doing, it's what I call a substitute and cryptogram approach. This especially works if it's just weird shapes or letters that you're not familiar with or, um, you know, I mentioned the Futurama cipher or Futurama code before, uh, which just looks like a bunch of squiggles really. If you just go through there and say, oh, this first one, I've decided that that is A, and you just go through and replace that one with A every time you see it, and then the next character is B, and you replace it with B every time you see it until you've done all of the characters on the page, and then put that into a cryptogram solver, which is, uh, you know, cryptograms like you have in the newspaper where they'll give you um, encoded text of a quote or something and you're trying to solve, well, what what is this quote? The cryptogram solver will then turn that back into regular text for you. So a lot of codes, basic codes, and even a lot of ciphers will actually fall to that. Um, you know, there's a couple of really sort of cute sounding ciphers like the Kama Sutra cipher and the Vatsyana cipher, that sort of thing, that have a method for encoding their text, but the cryptogram approach will crack them. You know, in the end, they're really just sophisticated cryptograms. Nothing beyond that. Um, but that's the that's the big thing. You know, just familiarize yourself with what's what's available in the world, and start playing with it. I, when I was working on the book, in the back of the book, I have um, some flowcharts that help with this. That will ask you, you know, does the text contain only numbers and letters? If yes, then go over here, look at this, that sort of thing. Um, when I was building those, all I did was sit at like the various cipher sites, put in some coordinates, and then look at what the result looked like. You know, what characteristics does this result have? So my advice is to take your local coordinates, like take your home coordinates, put it into some of these, go to Rumpkin and just put it into every single cipher and just see what does it look like when it's encoded? What do coordinates look like when it's encoded using Foursquare? What do ciphers look like when they're encoded using a Vignier cipher? Whatever. Just so that you can start familiarizing yourself with it. 
All right, let's go to a few more uh, uh, points in the live Q&A. And Limax has one that he's uh, uh, has a puzzle called Bacon Bits, which is a string of uh, hexadecimal numbers. And he gives us the uh, geocaching toolbox link uh, to check out the uh, Baconian cipher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, probably the one that I've been talking about. I haven't looked at that particular one, but... And then the uh, uh, right coaster uh, says that uh, his uh, lesson, the best lesson that he gets out of this and from your book is to not overthink the problem. And thank you for that. Then uh, Limax also goes back and says, uh, the kind of puzzle that really throws him are stenography puzzles. We have one out here that doesn't appear to be a hidden picture, nor is there any extra text at the end, but I'm not sure what else to try. Yeah, the problem with steganography. And so... Steganography is a kind of a new thing that's uh, come around in the computer age where, um, you know, photos, images, the computer doesn't see an image when the computer looks at it. The computer sees a block of text, and then it translates that into an image for you, for you to see. And some crafty people have figured out that they can go into that text and insert other things, you know, other lines of text, web links, that sort of thing. And it doesn't actually change what the picture looks like. You can even hide entire pictures inside other pictures. And it will just be there inside the text, and the computer ignores it. But if you know how to get the computer to pay attention to it, it will show up for you. The problem with steganography is that for most of the methods, you can only get that information back out if you do exactly what person that put it in there did. So there's a hundred different programs that will put that information in there for you and you put it up on a cache page, but if you don't tell your solvers which program you used, they're going to have a really hard time figuring out how to get that information back out. You know, a lot of these steganography programs are very, very specific and you can only get out the way that you got in. So my advice on that is if you think you have a steganography problem, email the CO and say, look, I think this is steganography. I'm not sure what website or what program would you suggest I use to determine if this is steganography. And hopefully they will say, oh, well, this one is nice, <laughs> and point you towards the one that they used. Hopefully. Hopefully. Or they just say, ah, it's not steganography. You're, you're up the wrong tree. Go look at something else. There's also that. <laughs> right, but at least the puzzle owner, in most cases, will help you uh, get, a, get a grip, get some traction on which direction you should be going. In most cases, yes. Yeah. Uh, there, we all know that there are some bad COs in the world that uh, are not friendly and will not help you in that sort of way, but for the most part, you know, as a puzzle CO, I put these things out to be found. You know, I'm not there to vex you, I'm not there to make your life hard, I'm not there, you know, I'm just trying to put an extra little layer of enjoyment on it somehow, mm -hmm. and to me this is providing that. So if you're having trouble with it and you email me and say, look, I can't figure this out, I will always be there to give you a hint. And so, you know, if you're really having trouble with it, email the CO. If you email the CO, just please do a couple of things. <laughs> please tell them which, which puzzle you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people are under the mistaken impression, um, especially now with the new messaging system, that if they click the name on the cache page, the CO somehow gets told where that email is coming from, like where the link originated, and that's not true. You know, if you send me an email, all I get is your name. So I have no idea which puzzle you're talking about. So if you just email and say, oh, I'm having trouble with this puzzle, then we have to go back and forth a couple times. Which one? What are you talking about? So tell me which puzzle you're looking at. Also, list a couple of things that you've already tried. That helps the CO to know, well, you're overcomplicating things, or you're just completely barking up the wrong tree. You know, you're looking at something else entirely, something that's coincidental 
to the page. You know, I had uh, I had a puzzle a couple of years ago that my regular beta tester, I sent it to her, and she obsessed over the fact that I had a misspelled word in the description and was convinced that that was somehow part of the puzzle and then came back to me like three hours later and it's like, I've looked at this every way I can. I can't figure out what it is. It's like, well, it's a typo. So you're just looking at the wrong thing. You're just concentrating on the wrong thing. So give them an idea of what you tried because that'll help. And it'll also let them know what kind of hint they should give you. You know, should it be just a gentle nudge or should it be a kick off a cliff? You know, a CO should be able to temper their hint a little bit to let you know, either give you a huge hint or a small hint, depending on where you're at in the puzzle, what kind of things that you've tried. There are puzzle COs out in the world that are just horrible people and who have the opinion that, well, if you can't solve it, then you're not meant to find it. I'm sorry. Um, I, I apologize to anybody who feels that way. I know I just called you a horrible person. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, but... You know, that's my job, by the way. Being a horrible person? No, to or apologizing. People. Oh, to offend people. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to step on your toes then. <laughs> um, but if you do happen to come across one of those CEOs who's just not going to help you, then there's a couple of Facebook groups now that help people with puzzles. Um, there's a couple of uh, uh, like some local puzzle solving groups and there is at least one that I know of like national puzzle solving group that have pretty good ethics as far as I'm concerned like the one in particular that I'm thinking of have a no FDF policy they won't help you if the FDF hasn't gone out and they will not just flat out tell you the answer they are there to help you not to just give you the coordinates um, so that's a place that you can turn you can also you know, like I was saying earlier, different people's experience are going to make different things easier for them. So start showing that puzzle to other people. You know, show it to your mom, your sister, your buddy at work. Your, you know, you never know what point of experience mm -hmm. is going to be the thing that breaks that puzzle open for you. And they may have exactly what you need, and you just don't realize it. You know, if it's so. Uh, there are a couple of ways, and also I always find that working with someone on a puzzle is often much easier because you have ways of, um, I, I think just explaining what you're thinking about to somebody else actually helps you to think about it. You know, to actually have to verbalize something changes the way you think about it. So having that experience will help. And again, they may have experience that you don't that sort of thing. Um, so look for a puzzle buddy at a at an event. You know, Maybe you can start putting together a little puzzle solving group and you guys can work on those puzzles together um, if the COs aren't being helpful. There's some, some steps you can take to get out there. Worst case scenario is you put it on your ignore list and walk away. That is the worst case scenario. <laughs> that is always, always a sad thing to have to do. But there are there are caches in the world that you just have to ignore. You, you may not be destined to get every single cache in your town. Sad to say. <laughs> Sad to say. That's right. Well, we've talked a lot about COs or cache owners. Um, is there some... It, should we look at styles that uh, cache owners or puzzle cache owners tend to use? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, that's another thing that I would encourage you to do, like going to events and that sort of thing, um, or just emailing the COs, is to get to know who the COs are. Uh, a lot of times, you know, just like going back to my San Francisco example again, you know, there's a lot of programmers that live in San Francisco, so there's going to end up being naturally a lot of computer-based puzzles, just because that's who those people are, and that's the thing that they're familiar with. So if you know, you know what the CO does for a living or what kind of hobby he has, that sort of thing, that might help you. Um, I, I just cracked one actually just earlier today that hinged entirely on the fact that the CO was also really 
hugely into um, benchmarks. But if you didn't know that about the CO, it took a lot of work to figure out like what exactly you were looking at. But once you knew, oh, he's also found over a thousand benchmarks, let me look at some benchmark logs and see what's, is there a benchmark that's close to where this puzzle is? Oh yes, actually there happens to be. Let me look at the log for that. So, you know, and that just came from knowing who that person was and like how that came into being. Um, so yes, get to know your COs. And a lot of them will also have like styles, you know, it's just like a writing style or a speaking style or that sort of thing. Um, there'll be different ways that they hide information on the page that is their favorite way to do it. Uh, or maybe they're just fascinated with codes, so you're going to expect that there'll be a code at some point in every cache because that's their their thing, that's their hook that they always use. Um, you know, for me, a lot of my caches tend to be, I, I really like physical things, so I of the 20 puzzle caches I have out, I think five or six of them at this point have some physical 3D thing that you have to like print and build or manipulate physically in order to solve the puzzle. So, you know, that's become one of my like signature style things of having that step incorporated into it. And then if you're just absolutely stumped and you have nowhere else to go, it's just like if you're on the trail and you're just absolutely can't find it, start reading the old logs. People yeah. will say all kinds of things not realizing that they're spoiling a puzzle or or sometimes intentionally spoil the puzzle, you know, throw hints into their logs, that sort of thing. Start looking at those old logs and see what's there. You know, what kind of thing what kind of thing pops up in that information. They might make a reference to something that you hadn't considered yet or might make a reference to something that you have considered just from a completely different angle, that sort of thing. So uh, that's always a very helpful step as well, reading those old logs. Excellent information. And there's a whole bunch more uh, in the uh, book, which I've not read, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's what, 300-something pages, I think? It is just over 300 pages, yes. Um, 17, 17 chapters, uh, breaking down, you know, different styles of puzzles. It's, it's designed, like I was saying earlier, it's designed basically as a textbook. You know, it starts off with um, basically the stuff that I talked about at the beginning of the show. You know, here's how to look at a cache page, here's the things that can change, that sort of stuff. Then it moves into, you know, here's what coordinates are, here's how to understand coordinates, here's all the different ways that coordinates can be written, that sort of thing, and then builds up to ciphers and codes and using music and steganography and uh, all the wonderful other ways that puzzle COs have come up to do things. Then you get into the back and it's a true like reference section. I have, um, I think there's six or seven uh, appendixes at the back that have websites that are useful, lists of websites, that sort of thing, um, broken down by category, what they are. I also have the different geocaching rules for the different listing services, um, so it's not just focused on geocaching.com. I do give you some information about some of the other listing services as well. Um, and then, of course, there's the Cypher flowcharts that are very popular that will... It, it won't solve every Cypher in the world for you. That's not something that's possible to do, but it will at least give you a way of looking at ciphers. And it's, um, you know, it starts off asking you very simple questions about how the text is arranged, what kind of characters are in the text, that sort of thing, and then gives you suggestions on, um, you know, well, maybe you should look at hexadecimal, or maybe you should look at uh, Rot64, that sort of thing, to help you understand basically how to approach a cipher, what kind of things that you're looking for. So, it's a lot of information in there. It is It is a lot of information. It is, and you can uh, find out more about that and order it through uh, howtopuzzlecache.com, and we'll, of course, uh, put the link in our uh, show notes to that website. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and thank you for joining us. 
This was a great uh, show for people just looking to uh, figure out how to puzzle cache. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's uh, some good information and wasn't uh, too overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got an hour of uh, great information about how to puzzle cache. But talking about how to and what's coming up, Chris, you know, I already know what all the shows are that's coming up, but uh, we're, we're going to quiz you and see if you know who's coming up on all of our shows. Okay, with my eyes closed. Next week, we're talking with Dano of Team Pugach about how to gear your bike. We've already talked to him once. This is the second one. And even better, it's, it's fun when we get guests on the show, but it's even better when the guests bring their own prizes to give away. So he's giving away a uh, prize pack that he's developed uh, during that show, and he's giving it away live, so you're going to have to listen live. May 21st is our next randomized show, and I'm excited... As a guest, we're going to have Michael Miller of Caching Released. He'll be joining us for that one. That's a relatively new geocaching podcast. Uh, if you haven't listened to it, go take a listen. I think you're going to like it. May 28th, we are talking with Dudley Grunt and Native Texan about open caching North America. Two great people. Uh, June 4th, we are talking about boating. This is with Aaron of CoinsAndPins.com, who's giving us some lovely prizes to give away. And finally, June 11th, we are talking uh, about geocaching.com guidelines. So send in your questions by June 4th if you have any questions, any clarifications on geocaching.com guidelines. And for your chance at another prize from coinsandpins.com next week, we need you to email your answer by May 13th. So get an email ready to geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com with the title question 176. Drop your geocaching.com screen name into the body of that email and head over to the cashmaniacs.com site and look up the episode number for the first Gear Your Bike show. It's easy. Include your geocaching.com screen name and the episode number of the last Gear Your Bike show, uh, which was nearly three years ago. So that's in the body of your email titled question 176 to geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com, and that has to be here by 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, 6 p.m. Pacific on June 13th for your chance at that prize from coinsandpins.com. Plus, join us live next week, as the bad cop just said, for a chance at that cool live prize from Dano. I, can't I think you it. mean May 14th. I, or May, thir May 13th, rather. I did, I did. Ah, thank you for catching that. That would be a rather tough one to have in June. So May, next week. One week from today. Well, it depends on when you listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> there we're getting into time, and I can't believe it's been three weeks since we had uh, Dano to talk about gearing a bike. Or, I'm sorry, I can't figure out time. Three years since we've had Dano on here. Wow, I'm old. But one thing I do know is you need to check the Cache Maniacs website at cachemaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647, by emailing geogearheads at cachemaniacs.com, or through the many channels of social media. Your support helps keep the Cache Maniac shows coming please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cash Maniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. The show's copyright 2015 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Guess we're the Cash Maniacs!